Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Darwin, Finches and Poker Chips, an Agile Journey. Uh, my name's Dawn Holmes. And my name's Bill Lee. And our goal today is to whet your appetite about some of the Agile techniques that we've used along our journey to becoming Agile. Um, we hope that that will inspire you to go and find out a bit more for yourselves and maybe give some of them a try. In this session, we'll have a brief introduction and then we're going to take you through our three favourite techniques. And then at the end, there's a summary and uh, hopefully time for questions and answers. We hope that this session will have something for everybody. For those of you who are new to Agile, um, we hope that this will uh, inspire you to go and find out a bit more, even if you choose not to go full-blown Agile. And for those of you who are already using Agile, we hope this will show them from a different point of view, more a customer-focused point of view. The University of Edinburgh is an ancient university. It was founded in 1583, and its former students and staff have been at the forefront of knowledge throughout their history. Names have included the likes of Charles Darwin, Lister, Bell, and Higgs. But it was Charles Darwin that caught Don and I's attention, and it's from him that we've taken inspiration for the theming for this presentation today. We're naturally very proud of our history and traditions, but the fast pace of modern life continually brings us new challenges. Higher education now belongs to an increasingly competitive global market where IT plays an important role in delivering new innovative teaching techniques. Concepts that would have been quite alien to Darwin. But as Darwin would tell us, we must all continually adapt and change in order to survive. Products are under ever, projects are under ever-increasing pressure to deliver fit for purpose, value for money in ever shorter timescales. But research shows us that 70% of projects, or 68 if you were at this morning's presentation, fail. Um, a lot of those failures are attributed to the people elements of projects such as communication. So clearly something has to change. Like the animals on Darwin's Gallipagos Islands, IT has evolved and adapted on its own island, speaking its own language and working to its own priorities. Our academics and support staff and students have done the same. So our challenge as IT professionals is to learn to bring those islands together to build bridges between them, to allow the teams to come together and to deliver more successful projects. We believe that some of the techniques offered by Agile are the building blocks for those bridges. will allow the communities to come together to deliver what's really valued and needed by our institutions. We embarked on our Agile journey about four years ago in an attempt to improve the value for money our customers receive and to make our projects more successful. We passionately believe that Agile has much to offer. It promotes incremental and iterative software development and it enables us to offer rapid and flexible response to any changes our customers might make at any point in the development life cycle. There are many Agile methodologies each with their own approach, each with their own deliverables. But we've cherry-picked through these and pulled together a number of practices that seemed to work for us. We found that you didn't need to follow extreme programming to the letter. You didn't need to do everything exactly as Scrum suggests. Over the course of this presentation, we're going to explore with you three of the collaborative Agile techniques that have helped us to build a bridge between our IT island and our customer island, including user stories, relative size estimation, and poker chip prioritization. The first building block towards our bridge is user stories, a technique for gathering business requirements. 
So why might we want to change from some of the more traditional methods? The first problem we found is that business requirement documents tend to be very large, very detailed documents written in IT speak. Terminology such as functional requirements, non-functional requirements, page after page of the system shall. Terms that mean very little to our customers. How many of us can honestly say that our customers have properly read and understood those documents when they signed them off? Or would we suspect that these are regarded as IT documents written on IT island and for IT use? The information in these documents is a summary of a lot of other conversations that have gone on, usually gathered by a business analyst who's spoken to some people, who in turn may have spoken to some more people, and has then been summarised up into one huge document before it's passed to the developers. So the developers may be receiving that information second, third, or even fourth hand so little surprise that much of the original meaning can be lost in translation. Allow us to demonstrate. Bill is the local vehicle salesman. He's met with his customer about his requirements and he's now contacting the garage to see if they've got what he's looking for. Good morning, vehicles are us. Oh, good morning. I've had a customer of mine in who's looking for a new vehicle. I've taken a note of his requirements and I'm just phoning to see if you've got anything suitable in stock. Okay, exactly what are you looking for? Well, he's really looking for a vehicle with a large, powerful engine. Okay, large, powerful engine. Big wheels at the front. Okay, wheels, big wheels at the front. Particularly at the back though. Bigger wheels at the back. Power steering is essential. Yep, powered steering. But it's only for one. Okay, so it only needs to take one person. A tow bar would be a really helpful addition. Yeah, we could have a tow bar fitted. But it has to be in yellow. And in yellow. Do you know what? I think we've got exactly what you're looking for. Super. Send it over as soon as you can. Needless to say, Bill's customer's not going to be very pleased when his vehicle arrives, even though I delivered exactly what he asked for. Delivering what our customers ask us for doesn't always mean that we're delivering what they actually need. So what's the answer? Well, we could try and produce even more documentation, try and capture every last detail of what's being asked for. But no matter how detailed we make these documents, they're still only a summary of all those conversations. They can't capture all those side conversations, the body language, the, um, the tone of voice that went on in those original conversations. The only way to truly capture what a customer wants is for the developers and the customers to get together. This will allow the developers to gain a deeper, more meaningful understanding of what's being asked for so that we can deliver something more appropriate, so more of a tractor than a car. This is where user stories come in. Rather than trying to capture the full detail of what's being asked for, it's a brief sentence that's a reminder to have a conversation, written by the users themselves in ordinary everyday language in the format as a some role, I want something, so that, and then the reason. So a farmer's user, Bill's farmer's user story might look something like this. As a farmer, I want big tires so that the vehicle has extra grip when plowing the steep and muddy fields. There's enough detail here to capture the high level requirement of what's being asked for so that project planning can take place but it is deliberately brief enough to force that conversation. The most important part here is the so that, as this captures the purpose or the benefit of that particular requirement. How steep and muddy are these fields? Is extra grip the only way of getting it? How might we test it? And this gives the developer opportunity to ask these types of questions. 
It also helps our customers to understand why they want this bit of functionality. If they can't think why they need it, then maybe they don't really need it at all. Maybe they're just asking for it because that's how it's always been done. And now might be a good opportunity to look at alternative ways of delivering that. So requirement gathering takes place at a story writing workshop. We gather all the stakeholders together. So this could be researchers, support staff, students, and most importantly, the developers. Anyone who might be affected by the project is invited along, the more the merrier. Everyone is invited to write user stories from their own point of view. The stories are captured on index cards or post-its, something that's small so that they can't write too much. We just provide lots of pens, lots of post-its and lots of coffee. They're written by the users themselves in ordinary everyday language. No IT speak, so they're easier for everybody to understand. Even the technical requirements, you know, backups and data archiving and things can be captured in the same sort of way. Using this everyday language improves communication and helps people get bought into the project and it helps to pull those islands together. Having the developers involved means if there's anything that's not clear, they can ask at the time. They'll hear all those conversations firsthand. These workshops don't take long. Even on a large project, usually within a couple of hours, you can capture the key requirements. So might this be what your next business requirements document looks like? For us, user stories really worked. Right from the very first project we tried it on, we found that getting people together to talk about their requirements promoted strong project buy-in and rapport across the university. We've even had com people come forward afterwards to say how much they enjoyed the experience and volunteering to test their user stories, which is something that we've struggled with on more traditional projects. Having improved the way we capture requirements, estimation proved to be the second building block that helped us build our Agile Bridge, and another aspect of our projects that changed significantly over our Agile journey. Gone were the days when we spent a lot of time estimating our projects in real days and hours, and in came the very different technique of relative size estimation. Or as I like to say, in came everything from Darwin's finches to Italian mathematicians. If I were to ask you a simple question like, how long does it take to get to the office? Your estimate's going to be influenced by many factors. Perhaps the method of transport that you use? How familiar you are with your route? Or what day of the week you happen to be travelling? Or maybe it's just how optimistic you are. So, estimating something simple like how long does it take to get to the office isn't as straightforward as it might seem. In fact, estimation is something that we find it difficult to get right. It's an art, not a science. Some would say a black art. It's an inherently predictive activity and is full of inaccuracies. It will need revisiting and refining through time, and like all art, gets better with practice. In our IT projects, we use our estimations for many things. One is to give our customers an idea of what's a big job and what is not. But primarily, we use our estimation to help us plan out our projects. And traditionally, the creation of a project plan would involve us estimating the time required to complete each and every task that we deem necessary in order to deliver the solution. Then we add up all of these estimates to produce one big guess at how long the project will last. Taking into account, of course, both foreseen and unforeseen impediments. And we do so in absolute terms, in real units of measure in days 
or hours. The problem is that in estimating our tasks in real time, particularly at the beginning of projects when we know very little detail, we suggest a level of accuracy that simply isn't there. Because in the real world of software development, there are numerous unknowns. Technology changes, requirements evolve, dependencies between tasks shift. We are therefore giving our customers a false impression of exactly how long it will take to deliver their solution. And we're also not really giving them an appreciation of what's a big job and what is not. Agile project teams take a different approach to estimation. They don't use an absolute scale, preferring instead to estimate using a relative unit of measure that's not time-based, but size-based, where size is a reflection of the effort, the complexity, and the risk. There are many size-based scales that we could use, some teams prefer to use something that's non-numeric as a way of emphasizing the relative nature of their estimation. Animal analogies are a good example of this. Here, the size of the animal reflects the relative size of a story. So, a story deemed to be a small giraffe is going to have far less effort, complexity or risk than a story deemed to be a large giraffe. Darwin's finishes also make a good alternative scale. There's something quite exotic that you can instantly convert to time and come in a wide range of sizes. We used animal analogies in the early phases of our agile journey and found that they helped us to stop thinking in terms of days and hours, something that teams new to agile find very difficult to do. However, through time, we found this to be a bit limiting and preferred instead to move something more numeric. We chose what's arguably the most popular of scales, the story point, where the number of points is an indication of the relative size of the story. But we didn't only move to a numeric scale, we made the sequence non-linear in an attempt to emphasize that in larger stories, there's a greater degree of inaccuracy around our estimation. We made use of the popular nonlinear sequence described by the Italian mathematician Fibonacci. Some of his sequence is shown here. But using a, a, a nonlinear sequence helped us in another way that we weren't expecting. It helped us to arrive at the size of our stories much quicker because if we think that a story might be 21 points, it's far easier and quicker to reach that conclusion if the values either side are either 13 or 34 in comparison to using a linear sequence when the values would be 20 or 22. Relative size estimation opened up another technique to us that helped us build our Agile bridge. Rather than holding long, detailed estimation sessions, ours became much shorter because we played a game of planning poker. In planning poker, your estimators are given a deck of cards with values such as these shown here. And after each story has been discussed, the team will pull out the value of card that they think represents the size of the user story. But the great thing about planning poker is it's consensus based. So the whole team have to arrive at the same value. And if they don't do so first time round, the discussion continues until they reach agreement. And studies have shown that planning poker produce estimates that are less optimistic and more accurate than traditional techniques. So, by the end of our estimation process, we had a set of requirements, our user stories, that were marked up with an estimate relative to each other that was good enough for planning purposes without implying a level of accuracy that wasn't there, but also 
allowed us to very clearly show our customers what's a big job and what is not. So having gained an understanding of the requirements through our user stories and whether they're big or small via relative size estimation, the next step is to establish which are the most important and will bring the most benefits. For this, we use poker chip prioritisation, our third item in our Agile Bridge. So why, why change? Well, for us, Traditional prioritisation usually involved a, a rather long, dreary meeting where we would review the business requirements, discussing each individual requirement and debating how important it was. It's a pretty mundane task, particularly on larger projects, and people soon lose interest. We found that we would get an enthusiastic or strong-minded person who would skew the discussions and not let everybody get a fair say. We found there was a tendency for everything to be marked as a must-have, regardless of the budget. This removed any flexibility in project delivery as the project progressed, and we found that the budget just wasn't going to stretch that far. So now, we play poker chip prioritisation. The way this works is we get the stakeholders together again, we spread out the user stories on a table. There are no chairs, so that everybody has to stand up and walk around. Everyone's given a budget of poker chips, which they can spend on that functionality. So they walk around the table, they choose the things that are most important to them, and they place the chips onto those cards. At the end, the, po the cards with the most poker chips are the highest priority. So why does this technique work so well? Well, it, it makes everybody read the requirements. If nothing else, they have to walk around the table and read them all to look for the ones that they want to vote for. It enforces the concept of a budget. There aren't enough chips for them to put them on all of the requirements that they want. The poker chips feel like money, and that reinforces the idea that functionality costs money. Because there isn't enough chips to go on every card, the different options have to be evaluated. Is that requirement more important to you than this one? Because you can't put your chips on them both. Everyone has poker chips, so everybody gets a say. No one person's going to be skewing those discussions. It's much more engaging. People are stood up, they're moving around. The poker chips themselves are very tactile, so there's no more falling asleep. And it's very quick and easy. Even for a large set of requirements, this doesn't take long, which means that you can repeat it at various points in the project as priorities start to change and new requirements come in. We've used different variations on this technique, using perhaps the different colours of the poker chips to have uh, for different priorities, or having certain bits of functionality cost more chips if they're a larger size. Whichever variation you use, we'll sure that we're sure that involving everybody in the process and letting them have a say means you'll end up with a much Yippee! more satisfied customer. <laughs> Over the course of this presentation, we've explored with you three of the collaborative Agile techniques that have helped us to build a bridge between our IT island and our customer island. We, we talked about user stories that enforce a closer collaboration between developer and customer that results in the developers having a much deeper and more meaningful appreciation of exactly what a customer wants but it's also empowered the customers to take ownership of the solution because they know exactly what we built. Then there was relative size estimation that's given the customers a greater appreciation of the cost of one feature over another. And when used in conjunction with user stories, 
it helps our developers in their estimation and better informs the customers of what we've estimated. And finally, poker chip prioritization, the process of ranking user stories that's much more collaborative, more engaging, and far more fun. The feel-good factor that everyone has had their say. And these techniques are suitable for all sorts of projects, not just agile, not just software development. And while they can all be used individually, are far more powerful together. It's up to you to choose. So why not give them a try and start your own Agile journey? See for yourself how these Agile techniques can help to build bridges between the different communities, allowing you to bring you and your customers closer together to deliver more successful projects and to work as a team. Because a team working together towards a common goal will always outperform a group of individuals. Our parting thought for you today is that we can deliver more successful projects through effective collaboration, evolving from doing projects for customers to doing projects with partners. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any question for us? Um. I thought that, that was very interesting. Um, during the, the poker chip prioritization, um, are the participants allowed to talk? Because I've done such similar sessions to that, not using poker chips, where there, there was the fear that people would influence other people's opinions. So it was recommended that no one talked. And I was curious if that's what you guys did. Um, we've tried both techniques, and I think both have their own uh, pros and cons. I think if people don't talk, then there isn't that possibility to, for people to be influencing, especially when you have somebody senior in the room. However, we did find that when we allowed people to talk, there was bargaining went yeah. on. People who didn't have enough chips for all the things they wanted, so they would say, well, if, if you vote for that one, because I quite like that, and I'll vote for that one. You know, and they were sort of doing trade-offs between each other. So I think it, it would depend on the profile of the room and to, just to be cautious of those senior voices or loud, you know, more dominant personalities who might say, you're not voting for that. You, you put your chip on that one. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, do you still use business analysts on your project? And if so, how has their role changed in this working? Um, yes, we do still use business analysts. Um, we still do waterfall and agile projects. Um, so it, it, we have a, a checklist for whether or not we go agile or whether we go traditional waterfall. So traditional waterfall, we definitely have business analysts. Um, but within our agile teams, we also have a role for the analyst um, and they would be running the workshops and encouraging people to talk about their requirements and making sure they're getting captured. Um, and they also work on the reverse side of the user story card, which we didn't go into, where the conditions of satisfaction are captured. So the, the more detailed stuff around the testing and a bit more detail about what that story would look like. So they still have a role. Yeah. Hello there. I'm interested in the uh, relative estimation. How do you deal with the situation where you have a project arise where uh, we can save 50k by doing this project, but we've only got 30k to spend, so if this project is going to cost more than that, we don't want to do it? How much is it going to cost? Okay, so we, the, the way we, have, we handle that, because when, when we start these, there's a fixed pot of money already decided. We have a, a sort of pre-development phase, we call it foundations, Scrum I think calls it iteration zero. Uh, and during that time we do some of the analysis up front and we, we put together enough of an estimate so that we usually know by, by that phase whether or not it's going to hit its minimum or not. Because what we tend to find is 
Uh, we, have, we give a percentage figure of the total project size that should go into this foundations phase. If that starts to take longer than we were anticipating, that's a sure indicator that it's definitely not. And then we go back to the sponsor at that stage and say it's unlikely we're going to do this within this budget. Time, time to take this last question. Are you okay? Hi. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned that you're doing uh, waterfall as well as agile. Um, why, why two methodologies and wh how do you decide which projects are going to uh, benefit most from agile? Um, we, we have a sort of checklist. We found that when we're working potentially with uh, third party suppliers or some of our legacy systems, or um, more infrastructure related more infrastructure related so we have a kind of decision tree that we would go through to see which which suited the best I think there is still a place for, for both methodologies to work alongside one another you know, like some of the, the earlier presenters were saying we we're still on a journey and we are very selective of of the projects we take on as agile one of the big criteria is customer engagement uh, that's that's one of, the, one of the reasons why Agile works, is because you demand a very high level of customer engagement. If we don't get that, if it's very obvious we're not going to get that, we wouldn't take an Agile approach. Okay. We're, we're, we'll be around this evening and all day tomorrow, so yeah. any more questions, we'd, uh, we'd love to speak to any of you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.